if you took some time off over Christmas, these early morning starts are a killer, aren't they? Uh, it's still pitch black outside. You've probably had quite a rude awakening. Some of you will have jumped straight into the shower, hit the day running. Well, many of us who have also discovered that there's this lovely thing called the snooze button on our phones and alarms. Just 10 more snuggly, dozy minutes would be just lovely. For some of you parents out there, you're thinking, what's an alarm? I'd love to wake up to an alarm. What's a good night's sleep? You know, at the start of a new year, we're starting a new series called Take Your Life Back. We... Um, We'll be sharing more on how we can practically do that on our Thursday nights uh, Zooms uh, uh, where we are putting some more discipleship stuff into practice there. But I want to challenge us as a church today. I want that that these 15 minutes will be a real wake up call to us in one way or another. Let me take you to two places in the Bible. The first is in 1 Kings chapter 20, King Ahab, Israel's worst king most evil king ever. He was disobedient to Yahweh full stop. God uh, sends a prophet to warn him, to remind him that he sees everything that he's up to. But to get anywhere near the king, the prophet has to use a made up story to get the king's attention and audience. And he makes out as if he's one of the king's battle weary soldiers who'd lost a prisoner. His forfeit for losing the prisoner was his life or today's equivalent of half a million pounds. That's a lot of money. His excuse for losing the prisoner was he just slipped away while he was distracted. He was too busy doing stuff. The king basically says, well, if that was your agreement, it's your loss, mate. That's just tough. And then it's then that the prophet reveals his true identity. And he uses that same argument to point out to the king that he's done exactly the same thing in God's eyes. He's ignored God's instruction. He's let Israel's enemy, Ben-Hadad, go. And somewhat tongue-in-cheek, this prophet prophesies that King Ahab would dearly pay with his life. The second passage is in Revelation. John's vision while in captivity on the island of Patmos. It's like Jesus himself is walking through the churches at the time and giving his evaluation. And in chapter three, it's Sardis's turn. Sardis was a playground for the rich and famous in what is now Turkey. Uh, it was the original Monte Carlo, if you like, the Saint Tropez, the Chelsea, or if you're if you're thinking a little bit more local, perhaps I don't know, Harborn. And Jesus is speaking to their apathy. He says, "I know your deeds, church. You have a reputation of being alive, but you're dead." And he says, "Wake up." All is not lost. Strengthen what remains and he's about to die. King Ahab, most of the church in Sardis got distracted, got busy with their own agendas, their own reputation. They're uh, good and not so good. The church in Sardis backed on its reputation uh, uh, and Jesus saw the reality. They look busy, they look good, but they become fruitless for the kingdom of God. Unlike King Ahab, you and I, I'm sure, are not the worst people in the world by far. This isn't a Bethel bashing sermon either. But here's the challenge to you and to me, to us as the church, after 10 long months of COVID-19, as we face an unknown 2021 lockdown three, with our hand firmly faced, uh, fixed into the hand of an, a known God, it is time for us to wake up and to watch over, to guard our lives, to strengthen what remains. It's good to work hard. It's good to keep busy. Good to serve God. Actively care for one another. Proverb, uh, proverbs say that the devil finds uh, plenty of use for idle hands, idle lives. Don't hear me wrong. But there is a point when our busyness can become fatal, a dangerous distraction. There's a God honouring a family honouring balance to be had. Just don't get so lazy or don't get so busy with all the wrong activity that you miss God's potential in you for each and every day, each and every conversation. Like Martha in the Bible who just couldn't sit down, just couldn't sit at Jesus's feet and learn. We can be busy doing all sorts of good stuff, but we can be cooking up meals for Jesus that he never ordered, spending our lives on lovely things, honourable activity, but miss what God is asking us to do, asking us to become instead of those things. You know, I 
you and I need a physical balance of work, activity and rest and sleep. It's vital to keep us alive. Maybe your colleagues and family know that you're a Christian. You have a, a good reputation for that. But my question to you is today is simply this. And you're not allowed to blame, blame COVID or Zoom fatigue or lockdown or I don't like technology. Are you being lulled into a kind of spiritual sleepiness? Proverbs thirteen twelve says that we can actually grow weary in our walk. Father, would you revive us? Would you wake us up to who you are and what you can do? Open our eyes to your creativity again, your bigness, to your ideas, your heart for us, to the importance of our daily devotions, our discipleship, for our marriages, our families, for this church, for this town, for this borough, for such a time as this. You know, Galatians 6, 9 says that uh, we can become weary in doing good. It wouldn't say that unless it was possible to get tired doing nice things, doing the right things, never mind all the wrong uh, good things too. So let's play spirit smart. Let's make sure that we're God's word wise rather than just worldly wise. Folks, God has a wonderful purpose for you. For his church let's not be found sleeping god is in the business uh, of not building fat christians I, i'm talking spiritually fat now uh, seriously god never intended his church to be full of spiritually overweight christians who simply live off other christian people's encounters and experiences or consume god tv and some of that is absolute trash folks he, he doesn't expect us to simply lift off sermons and podcasts and other people's kindness. You and I need to grow. And we do that by meeting, learning, worshipping, serving, praying together. And I will always be learning from his word, discovering new things about God. And how much more knowledge do we need? How many spiritual calories are we burning off as well as taking in? James 2.17 says, in the same way, faith by itself, if it's not accompanied by actions, is just dead. God's looking for a spiritually fit, healthy church that's awake to the spirit and the needs of those people that we live alongside in our streets, our offices, our neighbourhoods, our schools, our universities, even if we're meeting online today. 1 John 5 19 says we know that we are children of God that the whole world is under the control of the evil one we know also that the son of God has come and given us understanding you know two of the devil's biggest tactics is to either knock us or rock us he'll knock us out of step with Jesus or unity with the people in his church or he'll rock us slowly to sleep to close our spiritual eyes Ever get to that point where you just can't keep your eyes open any longer? Some of you perhaps are already there today. A lady in her previous church used to sit on the second row every single service. And I think even before the announcements, certainly through the sermon, there she was, head back, drooling on whoever happened to sit next to her. Being a passenger in a car naturally just makes me sleepy. That verse uh, that we've just read actually says that the whole world is under the devil's sway. It's like it's been rocked to sleep subtly by the devil, like it's a child on his lap. What a picture. So here's what happens when we're spiritually sleepy, folks. We become vulnerable. We lose out spiritually. We miss opportunities. Like Noah lost his dignity when he fell asleep drunk. We also become vulnerable when we begin to spiritually fall asleep. Folks, we need to be regularly asking ourselves, what, who cut in on my walk with Jesus? How far have I left God? God doesn't leave us. We walk away. What have I lost? while I was spiritually sleeping. You know, one of the most encouraging verses in scripture for any preacher is found in Acts 20. Uh, it's a guy called, it's about a guy called Eutychus. He was uh, sat on a window ledge listening to Paul and Luke tells us that he was sinking into a deep sleep as Paul talked on and on. Have had that feeling? 
Well, I'm so glad that Paul's no different to me or to any one of us. Perhaps he should have uh, put a few more funny illustrations or something in his talk or perhaps used a, a better uh, PowerPoint. But Eutychus is slowly falling asleep and he slowly falls into a deep sleep and falls out of a third story window. I guess you could say he literally dropped off. Now, this guy came with good intentions. He wanted to hear Paul's speech. He wanted to hear what this man had to say. The thing that disturbs me is this, that when he started to breathe a little bit heavier, when he started to lose control of his neck and, and he started to nod and, and wobble, when he started to drool down the shoulder of the, the person sat next to him on the window ledge, no one prodded him. No one woke him up. This crowd seemed totally unaware of the slumber of this man. Maybe they were selfish, wanting to hear the words of Paul for themselves, but no one looked out for Eutychus. Let's keep looking out for each other, folks. Luke 9.22 talks about when Peter, John and James were sleepy and they missed out on an amazing encounter. When they did wake up, they caught the tail end of the transfiguration. Have you ever wondered about how much of that amazing event they missed. Church, let's wake up to our present strength. As it says in Romans 13, let's throw off everything that would hinder. Let's wake up to any spiritual slumber we may be entertaining. Let's understand the times that we're living in and let us, the church, clothe ourselves in the power, the love, the grace, the mercy of Jesus Christ. Let's wake up to our responsibilities, our spiritual responsibilities, part of the church here in Albury 2021. In John 3.16, a classic, well-known verse, you'll have seen it in football stadiums all over the place over the years. Jesus said this, God so loved the world. He didn't say God so loved the church. He said God so loved the world. And while we were still of the world, still messed up, still sinners, Christ died for us. He died for them, every single one of them who are dead in sin, dead to Christ, walking around, doing life spiritually asleep. I turned 50 last month. I know you wouldn't, you wouldn't guess that, would you? Um, but time passes by so quickly. Is it possible that while we're going here and there doing one thing or another, the version of ourselves that Jesus sees we are capable of becoming, who we were meant to become, that we're meant to be like as we grow up in Christ, could slip from our grasp. I can blame no one but myself for the time that I've wasted over the last 50 years. I'm the one who should guard and watch myself. This week, on Thursday, I have a confession to make that I actually watched um, something I watch a lot to be honest I love watching the chase I love watching um, Bradley Walsh I think he's hilarious and uh, I love these folks uh, and the quiz side of this this uh, hour every day at five o'clock on the tv but you know on this one day I, I look back and I think I didn't really watch it I just stared at two screens the big screen in the corner of my lounge and the screen in my hand on my phone I have no idea what the questions were, I answered nothing and I have no idea whether the lady actually won the £60,000 in the end. I wasted an hour even just in that one day. You see, I have to watch myself. I have to super, supervise myself, lead myself. I can't blame anyone else for my lack. I don't want to slip through my own fingers. I don't want to end up stuck immature. I don't want to end up stuck selfish. I don't want to end up stuck with a small mentality, living in self-pity, smothered by anger or numbing and coddling myself spiritually when I'm meant to rise up in strength and rise up in the power that Jesus affords me through his spirit. You know, may this today be my wake-up call. May this today be your wake-up call. You are called by God to guard yourself, to keep this man, to keep this woman, as it said in 1 Kings, and, and to look after yourself lest you get away. Didn't Jesus himself say that it's easy to chase after the world, the stuff of the world, and to lose our soul? 
Matthew 16, 26, he says, what kind of deal is it to get everything you want, but to lose your soul, to lose yourself, to lose your true self, to lose a hold of yourself and to let yourself get away. I think that Jesus is warning in Matthew 16 is the same thing that's in 1 Kings 20, that we're meant not to be distracted by good stuff and and the not so good stuff, to be busy here and there, chasing after this and that and becoming defined by those things. How ironic that we may well get what we've wanted or worked hard for. Wonderful, but how sad if that's at the expense of losing the version of ourselves that we were meant to become. Don't let yourself get away. Proverbs 4.23 says, Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it springs the issues of life. There can be no... Uh, area quite like the heart that's able to control the outcome of our lives we're emotional beings we were made that way but we mustn't be led and ruled by our emotions I think our love lives are easily able to steer us we talk ourselves into dating people that we shouldn't date being with people that we shouldn't be with you know it's easy to let the issues of our hearts steer us away from where God wants us to go Jude in his little letter in the back end of the New Testament in verse 21 says, guard and keep yourselves in the love of God. Expect and patiently wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, we have to guard ourselves, our spirits. We have to guard our devotion times. We have to choose to do the hard things, to watch over ourselves, to be checking in with ourselves, to be answering the question, hey, time is passing. What will you do with what remains? Questions I need to ask more often, and maybe you do too. How am I doing? Am I getting better? Am I following Jesus better today than I did last year? Am I staying the same? Am I coasting? Am I drifting? Am I fighting? Am I advancing? Am I becoming a kinder friend? Am I becoming a nicer wife to live with? Uh, Am I becoming a better stepmom? Am I becoming a more patient manager? Sleep is funny, isn't it? You don't know you've been asleep until you wake up. It's the same when we become Christians, isn't it? It's like we wake up and we see the world differently. We wake up and we see our lives different. We wake up to grace. We wake up to our own need for forgiveness and our own need for someone bigger than ourselves to save us. I'm not too worried about how long you've been a Christian, but if you've been a sleepwalking Christian, I'm praying that God at the beginning of this new year would wake you up, that he'd wake me up, that he'd wake Bethel up and he'd wake the church of of Sanwell and the UK and the globe up. That we'd shake off the dust. That we'd put all those things down that would hold us back and get our feet, our spiritual feet, running in God again. That we would see his favour, see his blessing, see his freshness and new vitality in our relationship with him. That we would hunger after his word. That we would just be bossed in to read more about what he says in the Bible. That we'd be bossed in to be prayers and see answers to the things and the needs of those around us. That we would see the lost found, the prodigals return, the sick healed. To name but a few incredible dynamic things that God brings into our life when we wake up to him. Paul in Ephesians 5.14, and if you can imagine it, imagine that digital digital clock. Wake up, O sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Be careful then how you live, not as unwise, but wise, making the most of every day, of every opportunity. Will you pray with me? Father, we admit that we have at times been lulled into spiritual slumber. We've let other things take our attention, our energy, our time. We've let offences take root. We've let people and stuff cut in on, on our relationship with you and the time that we spend with you. Physically, spiritually, we are tired. Forgive us for falling asleep on our watch. Would you wake us up to your goodness, 
and your love, your grace and your mercy again? Would you wake us up to your purpose and your plan for your kingdom through our lives? Wake us up to the honour that we have to eat your word and live it, apply it to our lives every day. Wake us up to the calling that you have placed in us, the prayers you need us to pray, the people and places you need us to go. Wake us up to how you want to use our passions and abilities in this coming season. Wake us up to the desperate needs around us on our front lines and how we can do something about it. Wake us up to the world, the neighbourhoods in which we live. Wake us up to the transforming, life-changing power of the cross of Jesus. Wake us up to the presence of your Holy Spirit who lives in us and wants to do more through us than we could possibly imagine or think. Wake us up to the new possibilities, new dreams, new horizons, new life that you want to infuse your church, each one of us, with. May we be a church that is united and awake. May we as Christians wake up. Wake us up, God, to who you are, all that you are able to do. Open our eyes to our responsibility as your church to one another and to this dying world. May we see what you see. May we guard our hearts, grow in our discipleship. And may we be spiritually alert more today than ever before. Amen. God bless you, folks. Have a great day.